In today's video, I'm going to talk about EIP-165 called Standard Interface Detection. As the name suggests, the point of this interface is to help detect what interfaces are supported or implemented by a smart contract. This helps prevent tokens from getting stuck when users accidentally send their tokens to a contract address that does not support that token. If a token is owned by an address that belongs to a person, then that person can initiate the transfer. On the other hand, if that token belongs to an address that is held by a smart contract, then the smart contract has to support ERC-20 or ERC-721 in order to initiate the transfer of those tokens. If the contract doesn't know about ERC-721, then the tokens will be stuck in that contract. The way they might communicate is that contract 1 could ask contract 2, do you support these ERC-721 tokens? If contract 2 says yes, then contract 1 will go ahead and send the tokens to contract 2. However, if contract 2 says that it doesn't support ERC-721 tokens, then the first contract knows not to send the tokens to contract 2 because the tokens would simply get stuck in contract 2. As another example, let's look at the enumerable interface. To find out if a token supports this interface, we could ask the interface, hey, do you support total supply? That takes zero arguments. And do you also support token by index, which takes a UN256? And do you support token of owner by index? which takes in an address and another UINT256. Technically, that might work, but for very large interfaces that have tons and tons of methods in them, we need a more efficient way of asking if that interface is supported. The solution is to create an identifier for each interface. To do that, we're going to use the catchact 256 hash and the XOR operation. catchact 256 is a cryptographic hash function, so if you feed it some input, it will spit out some output that looks like random garbage. XOR is a logical operation that will take in two inputs and create some output. For example, if you give it two inputs, then it will compare the inputs bit by bit. If the bits are different, then the output is going to be a 1. If the inputs are the same, then the output is going to be a 0. XOR is often used to combine hashes, because the hashes themselves are kind of randomized, and then the XOR will combine the zeros and ones in a pretty random way as well. To create an identifier for our interface, we're going to take all the methods from that interface, perform the catchack hash on each of them, and then perform an XOR on the hashes. Earlier we saw that the enumerable interface has three methods, total supply, token of owner by index, and token by index. So for the first one, total supply, we can see that the output is this hexadecimal 18160DDD. For token of owner by index, we get another output like this. For token by index, we get a different result. Notice that we're passing the argument types into the hash. For example, because token of owner by index takes in an address in a UN256, we're just going to include that in the hash in its string form. In the final step, we're going to perform the XOR operation on those three hashes, and the output is this hexadecimal here. You can kind of think of this as the DNA fingerprint for this interface. No matter how big an interface is, whether it has 100 methods or 1,000 methods, we can hash all of the methods and then perform the XOR operation and then just generate a unique fingerprint that's four bytes long. In the Solidity language, bytes four represents a fixed length array of four bytes. It's often represented in hexadecimal. The zero X means that it's hexadecimal and each pair of characters represents one byte. For example, seven eight represents the first byte, zero E represents the second byte, and nine D is the third byte. For example, to ask if contract two supports the enumerable interface, then contract one can simply ask, do you support this hexadecimal identifier? And contract two can reply yes or no. There are multiple ways to calculate the interface ID. The first way is to use the catchact 256 hash and the XOR operation, which I showed you earlier. Another simpler way, which started being supported in later versions of Solidity, is simply to call type in parentheses using the name of the interface and then dot interface ID. The actual interface for ERC-165 itself is very short. It's simply one method called supports interface, where it's taking in the bytes for interface ID, and it's returning a Boolean, either yes or no, if that interface is supported. The virtual implementation of this returns true for ERC-165, because obviously this contract supports ERC-165. I can demonstrate to you how these IDs are generated with an example. This smart contract is an ERC-721 contract for creating NFTs. All ERC-721 contracts also implement ERC-165. We can see that in this NFT smart contract by following the chain of inheritance. So ERC-721 URI storage inherits from ERC-721. And ERC-721 inherits from a bunch of interfaces, including ERC-165. So if we finally go into ERC-165, then we see the supports interface method 
And right now it's just declaring that this interface supports ERC-165. Going back to our NFT contract, I've written some example methods that will show us how to calculate the interface ID. The first method, get ERC-165 interface ID, is going to return the interface ID for ERC-165 by calling the type and then ERC-165.interface ID. I'm also going to do the same thing for ERC-721 enumerable. I also have another function which will generate the interface ID by calling the ketchak hash and then casting to bytes for. So this method will take in an arbitrary string and then perform the ketchak 256 hash and then return the bytes. I've already deployed that contract onto the RinkB testnet. I've also verified the contract on Etherscan. So we can see this is the code for the smart contract, which matches what we saw earlier in Visual Studio Code. In the read contract tab, I can now call those methods to generate the interface IDs. For example, we can see that the interface ID for ERC-165 is this hexadecimal here. We only care about the first 10 characters, which represent the four bytes. The remaining zeros are just padded by Etherscan. So this is 32 bytes in total, but we only care about the first four. So this hexadecimal here is constant. So the ERC-165 interface is always going to correspond to this hexadecimal. We can do the same thing for the enumerable interface, and we see that the interface ID is this hexadecimal. For the ERC-721 standard, it looks like this. For the getInterfaceID method, I can pass in a string that corresponds to a method. So I'm going to use the method from the enumerable interface called token of owner by index, which, ta which takes in an address and UN256. And I can see that the interface ID for that method is this hexadecimal here. In older NFT smart contracts, we can also see these hexadecimal values hard-coded into their code. For example, if we look at the smart contract for the Board Ape Yacht Club ERC721 contract, we can also see these hexadecimals. In the Board Ape Yacht Club code, if I search for the caret symbol, that should take me to the XOR operations. And indeed, in the Board Ape Yacht Club code, we can see that they're performing the Ketchak 256 hash of all of these methods and then converting them to bytes for. And then the comments are saying that after performing the XOR operation on all of them, we have this output here, and then they're going to store that saying this is the interface ID for ERC-721. We can also verify that the interface ID that they're storing here, 80AC58CD, matches the hexadecimal that's returned by the smart contract example I showed. So this 80AC58CD is always going to correspond to ERC-721. The Board API Club code is doing the same calculation for the ERC-721 metadata interface. In the constructor for their smart contract, we can see that they're taking all of those interface IDs for those smart contracts, and they're calling the register interface method on them, which will add this ID into the collection of interfaces that are supported by the smart contract. Later on, if someone wants to check if the Board Ape Yacht Club smart contract supports ERC-721 and metadata and enumerable, then the caller can use the ERC-165 interface to say, hey, do you support the interface ID for ERC-721? And then the smart contract will return true because that interface ID is registered. The ERC-165 interface uses a private mapping to keep track of which interface IDs are supported. So the mapping is going to map from the interface ID to the Boolean true. In the constructor for ERC-165, we are going to register the ERC-165 interface ID because obviously this contract supports the interface ERC-165. Supports interface is going to take in, an, as an argument, the interface ID. And then it's going to check if that interface ID is supported by looking up that interface ID in that mapping. So it will return true if that interface ID is in the mapping. Otherwise, it will return false. We are going to add interface IDs into the mapping by calling the register interface method. This method will take in the interface ID and then add that interface ID into the mapping and set the Boolean value to true. In summary, the way that ERC-165 works is that to check if a contract supports an interface, you just call the supports interface method with the interface ID of the interface that you want to check. And then the contract will return either true or false if that interface ID is in the mapping. However, that doesn't really guarantee that the smart contract supports that interface. For example, instead of looking up the interface ID in the mapping on line 310, I could replace that line and just say return bool for everything. To an outside caller, they could pass me any interface ID they want, and I would be returning true in all cases, even though I don't really support that interface.
Therefore, ERC-165 is not really a security guarantee. It does not prove or guarantee that the contract truly implements that interface. The only real way to check might be to look up the code of that smart contract in Etherscan and pour through their code to make sure that they actually implement the interface that you're looking for. For the full details, I strongly recommend reading EIP-165 yourself after watching this video. If you learned something, please give a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.